On March 31st, 1929, a dozen women stood here amidst the Easter Sunday parade on Fifth Avenue. As the clock struck noon, they reached down, plucked a cigarette from their stockings, put it in their mouths, lit it up, and puffed away. Reporters flocked to them because they were the one thing you weren't allowed to be while smoking. A woman. Men had held the monopoly on wrapping their lips around phallic objects in public since the dawn of time. But thanks to a well-organized campaign by Sigmund Freud's nephew, Edward Bernays, these analog vapes were now a symbol of women's empowerment. They explained that the cigarettes were torches of freedom. But this wasn't a grassroots movement. American Tobacco had hired Edward Bernays to popularize cigarettes among women. Bernays got a start in propaganda during World War I, but realized he could take his talents to kill people for the private sector too. The Torches of Freedom campaign was wildly successful and kicked off Bernays' lofty career, which included tricking people into thinking that presidents were cool, changing the fashion industry's favorite colors to represent cigarette packaging, and overthrowing the democratically elected leader of Guatemala. In the 1940s, United Fruit Company, aka Chiquita, hired Bernays to sell more bananas. He got to work fabricating medical studies, putting bananas in the hands of celebrities, creating a disinformation bureau, and coming up with corny jokes like, is that a banana in your stocking? Or are you just happy to see me? But to find out how he'd oppose the democratically elected leader of a sovereign nation, we need to go to the scene of the crime, Guatemala City. This is your pilot speaking. And this is your pilot shouting. Please like and subscribe because this video took forever to make and I still have the taste of banana peel in my mouth and I'm going bankrupt because the stupid plane ticket was so expensive. Anyway, please buck up for landing. We'll be landing in just a sec. Thank you. We need some real quick context before we get back to Edward Bernays. Like how did United Fruit even own the land in the first place? This is the exact location in which Jose Maria Reina Barrios was assassinated in 1898 by a disgruntled military officer. It's now a street corner that contains a McDonald's. You see, Jose Maria Reina Barrios had this grand vision for Guatemala. He wanted to connect all of the plantations to a centralized rail network because uh, the Panama Canal didn't exist. So there was a dire need for infrastructure at the time here in Central America. Investment in the railroad ended up devastating the economy because it was extremely difficult to build it. So the next president takes over and a company by the name of United Fruit comes in and says, we'll build it so long as you give us some land grants for banana plantations. And he was like, that sounds good to me. Fast forward to the 1940s and UFCO owned 40% of arable land in Guatemala. In 1944, Juan José Arevalo overthrew the 13-year dictator and was democratically elected president of Guatemala. The most relevant part of his presidency was his support for the 1947 UN resolution that created the state of Israel. This will be really important in just a sec because this led to a deep partnership between the two countries. In 1950, Guatemalans democratically elected Jacobo Arbenz, the president of Guatemala. He was a social democrat who was understandably upset that so many Guatemalans could barely put food on the table while United Fruit owned 40% of the arable land but only cultivated 10 to 15% of it. Arbenz's election felt like a generational shift for Guatemalans. He decriminalized labor unions, invested in public infrastructure, and tackled corporate greed head on. The overwhelming majority of the population consisted of landless peasants, and for the first time in their lives, they had hope. So Arbenz passed the notorious decree 900, which said that landowners with over 600 acres of land had to allow the sale of any of their uncultivated land to the Guatemalan government at of the fair market value at which they were paying taxes. So basically the government could purchase, not seize, unused land for massive landowners at the fair market value at which they were paying taxes. But here's the catch. United Fruit had been vastly undervaluing their land to dodge taxes. So the government purchased it for pennies on the dollar, $525,000. Now, Big Daddy US came in and said, mm -mm, that's unacceptable. We want you to pay out as much as you possibly can to our darling UFCO. So they demanded $16 million on land, to be clear, that they were valuing at less than $600,000 for tax purposes. And this wasn't some crazy evil plot. Arbenz actually had to give up a bunch of his own land because of this decree. But it was a step too far for Uncle Sam. So the CIA turned to the best in the business, Edward Bernays. This is the Pan American Hotel here in Guatemala City in the heart of Zone 1. It's just down the road from the Constitution Plaza. And uh, in the 1950s, Edward Bernays would fly people out, like journalists, top editors, publishers from top newspapers like the New York Times, and house them in this hotel behind me. Just down the road over there is Constitution Plaza. 
Bernays hired locals to stage a protest against the Arbenz government here, all in plain view of the journalists' hotel rooms. It would be far enough away not to alarm them excessively and near enough to see the chaos unfold. Now, while the, the journalists and publishers were here in Guatemala, Bernays would set up meetings between them and some of the locals and possibly some politicians, and they would explain to the journalists how disgruntled they were with the communist Arbenz regime. But they weren't locals or politicians. They were just representatives of UFCO. When these journalists returned to the United States, they wrote scathing reports about the Soviets pulling strings in Guatemala, a mere stone's toss away from the United States. Alarm bells rang, people panicked, and consent was manufactured. Now, according to the CIA's internal reports, the United States had stopped weapons sales to Guatemala in 1951 and barred its allies from doing so in 1953. However, the straw that broke the camel's back was when in 1954, Jacobo Arbenz reluctantly bought a shipload of old, malfunctioning arms from Czechoslovakia. As this was the first time the Eastern Bloc had sold arms to a country in the Americas, the CIA claimed the country was compromised and in need of immediate regime change. Now, in the hot girl summer of 1953, the CIA launched Operation PB Success. On June 17, 1954, a ragtag rebel force of less than 500, trained and armed by the CIA and led by Lieutenant Colonel Castillo Armas, entered Guatemala from Honduras. One officer explained, the army soldiers were terrorized by the idea that the United States was looming behind Castillo Armas. Beyond this idea of the US backing the rebel forces, radio station Voice of Liberation repeatedly broadcast lies claiming that there were tens of thousands of soldiers in the rebel forces. It also called for their fellow Guatemalans to rise up against the radical communist Arbenz regime and take back their country. Now, the only catch was that the broadcast was actually recorded in Miami and they used your grandparents' tax dollars to transmit it all the way to Guatemala. I was called over to the Latin American branch and one of my friends was over there and he said, say, we've got a job for you. And I said, what are you talking about? I looked at this guy, this little guy, kind of, kind of nervous little fellow. And I told him, is that the guy? And he said, yes, that's him. We're going to make him president of Guatemala. I said, oh my God, come on now. This is ridiculous. We're going to spend all this money to put this guy as president of Guatemala? What we had, he was the only guy we had. With a leader in place, it was up to Redinger to train the rebel army. The troops mustered on a united fruit plantation. The force that went into Guatemala to, to take over was a very, very small force. It wasn't more than 20 or 30 people. I had to, uh, to help train these guys. Of course, we, we armed them and we took them out on the firing range and, and did that. What we tried to do more than anything else is imbue them with, with the idea of, of taking over their country. And they, some of them were pretty excited about it. And some of them were not too excited about it at all. They didn't want to get shot. On page 51 of the CIA's historical record, they recount using six F-47 fighter bombers, one P-38 fighter, one Cessna 180, and one Cessna 140 to bomb railroads, bridges, oil tanks, forts, and everything in between. Their goal was to create chaos in the illusion that the military had turned on the government and the president. Between the false claims on the radio waves and the bombs raining down from above, the army was psychologically defeated, and now they were unwilling to defend the government. Arbenz bent to America's incessant demands and resigned. Operation PB Success was the inspiration behind Diego Rivera's 1954 painting, Glorious Victory. In it, you can see the likes of Secretary of State John Foster Dulles, Rebel Leader Castillo Armas, President Eisenhower on the bomb, CIA Director Alan Dulles, and US Ambassador to Guatemala, John Parafoy. They're exchanging money while the indigenous laborers load bananas onto the boat behind them. A number of the indigenous workers are already dead, while others rot in prison. All while the church stands by idly and watches. Now, one of my biggest revelations in actually going to Guatemala and talking with people there was learning that Che Guevara himself was present in 1954 in Guatemala City. He saw this all unfold. In his own words, in a letter he wrote to a friend, he said, I was born in Argentina. I fought in Cuba and I began to be a revolutionary in Guatemala. 
to get a better sense of what happened after the CIA overthrew Arbenz. I visited the library's newspaper archive, and for the first time in my life, I was finally able to answer the age-old question, ¿Dónde está la biblioteca? And what I found was horrifying. You know, military dictatorship after military dictatorship. Cold War Red Scare propaganda. Israel missiles. A coffee ad. Human rights. <laughs> Just kidding. Israeli spy plane. Gaza. Guerrilla insurgency. A sulfuric acid advertisement? Reagan. Kissinger, Reagan, U.S. military in Honduras, Toyota ad, military tribunals, instability beyond belief, where every week must have felt like a decade. But I felt a seismic shift in their tone when they talked about two men in particular. And I reckoned if I wanted to learn more, I needed to go deeper and go to the heart of where these two men had the biggest impact in the country, and even talk with people who fought against them. I needed to go to the infamous town of Naba, located in the heart of the Ishil Triangle. This is Diego. He's 74 years old, and when he was just a kid, he left his hometown of Nabah to work on a farm near the coast over 150 miles away. ¿Cuánto pagaba? 25 centavos. Si trabajar en la costa, hay que trabajar cuatro días por esto. Cuatro días para ganar un quetzal en la costa. Limpiar café, limpiar caña, sembrar caña, sembrar café, sembrar banano. He joined the guerrilla because he had nothing. The guerrilla represented a fight against inequality. Donde ir a ganar solo en las fincas, cafetaleros, cañeros, que hacen azúcar. Mm. Paga muy barato y roba mucho. Ah. Diego believed America's worst export had destroyed his community and his country. Capitalism. Aquí el capitalismo nace por el mismo, la riqueza de la tierra. Mm. La tierra produce... Por ejemplo, estaba en Estados Unidos, porque también ahí, ahí nació primero el, el, el capitalismo, el monopolio, mm. ahí nace. Hoy viene aquí en Guatemala, ahora aquí, ahí en Guatemala. Mm. Pero vino a destruir al pueblo, mm. destruyó al pueblo, casi en todos los países. Mm. He said that the land was wealthy, but the people were not. The guerrilla fight was against monopolies and capitalism. Well, 
Por eso Cuba. ¿Cuántos todos tienen? Tienen carro, tienen terreno, tienen casa, tienen todo. Uh -huh. Tienen comida, tienen medicina, todo, todo tienen. Uh -huh. Aunque algunos no están de acuerdo, pero son los que no quieren trabajar. Uh -huh. Como nosotros, si no queremos trabajar, vamos a andar robando en Cuba, pero Cuba, los cubanos son acertados pues, para hablar, porque si todos tienen, mm. si, llegamos, si vamos a llegar en Cuba, pues que todos tienen. Nosotros no. Sí. No queremos ser un, un país socialista, mm -hmm. pero ¿qué tenemos nosotros? No tenemos nada, mire nuestro carretón. Mm. So, in a gorilla's own words, they were fighting to have a shot at a decent life. To break out of their chains, to own their own land, to not be a feudal peasant. Now, sure, in a, in a vacuum, this might not be compelling for the average person. But, in my opinion, what shifts the narrative is his harrowing description of those two men I kept encountering in those reports in the library. Murió mucha gente. Sí. Sí, murió mucha gente. Hicieron un, una, un hoyo. Sí, la misma gente lo hizo. Escaró en el hoyo, así. Sí, lo mataron a la gente, tiraron ahí. Sus pies arriba, así, su cabeza para abajo. Cuando lo escarbaron, los pies arriba. Botas arriba. Oh. Ah, triste. Recuerde los presidentes. Eh, durante la guerra. Entró el mejor mató es el, el, el Lucas y el Efraín Rios Montt. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Fernando Romeo Lucas Garcia and Efraín Rios Montt. These two men killed his friends, his family, his neighbors, and burned down his people's villages. Lucas Garcia was such a ruthless monster that the United States had to embargo the entire country of Guatemala because he kept using American arms to slaughter his own people. So in the late 70s, Jimmy Carter banned weapon sales to Guatemala. It wasn't that effective, actually. Weapons still got from the US to Guatemala, and as did military aid. But what was even more remarkable was how the void was filled. Remember that bit I said about Arevalo and Israel? Well, the US continued funneling weapons and aid to Lucas Garcia, but in the small vacuum created by Carter's weapons ban, Israel stepped in to fill the demand and sold Guatemala millions of dollars of arms. And today, when you go around, every soldier can be seen holding an Israeli Galil rifle and all the private security companies in charge of protecting capital are Israeli and every other boat on Lake Atitlan flies an Israeli flag because IDF soldiers love to come here for vacation after they're done murking Palestinian children. Anyway, Efrain Riosmont came into power in 1982 and was described by Ronald Reagan as a man of great personal integrity and commitment. Now, unfortunately, Reagan wasn't necessarily the best judge of character because the genocide actually reached its highest murder rates under Efrain Riosmont, with thousands being killed every month. One thing really stuck out to me in my travels to Nabah. Take a look at this map. You'll notice Nabah doesn't have a super rigid grid layout. But if you look at the small towns surrounding it, they have these really rigid structured grids. And that's not an accident. Nueva Esperanza, Akul, Akchumbal. These were concentration camps. These were villages set up as, as model villages, as they called them. And there were a bunch more in the surrounding areas. The military forced entire towns into these villages so they could watch over them and ensure the residents didn't misbehave. Any link whatsoever to freedom fighters like Diego was probable cause for the military to kill the entire family and burn down the village, which they did to the tune of 200,000 people, most of whom were Mayan. I visited all three of these villages and encountered nothing but extremely friendly locals, a few very cute stray puppies, and one horrifying military base still veiled from the public eye. In 2013, Rios Montt was tried in Guatemala and convicted of genocide committed against the Ishil people, Diego's brothers and sisters. He was sentenced to 80 years in prison. 
but at this point, he was already in his 80s, and a corrupt group of judges ended up throwing out all of the charges. Rios Montt died in 2018 at the age of 91, never having to atone for his crimes. And today, ex-military officer groups like Ave Milgua actively threaten politicians, historians, activists, anyone from trying to seek justice for those who they lost. Now, really quickly, let's take a step back for a sec. In moments like this, it's really important to analyze how the hell did we let this happen? Why was there a coup? Why was there an ensuing genocide? And I feel like it didn't really become evident to me until I saw this publication. This is the Latin American Report from 1961. It was written by William Godet, a CIA operative who helped form disinformation bureaus in collaboration with Edward Bernays. And he possibly helped kill JFK, but we don't have time to get into that. And uh, there's too many weird conspiracies around that, but just, you know, food for thought. Now, this publication was written for businessmen, men with power and money, capital, one might call it. And this article is effectively an advertisement for the great port of Louisiana, with the reasoning that it's well connected to these Latin American countries. And then he very explicitly states why that connection is so important. They can offer a US businessman sugar, coffee, cotton, lead, zinc, bauxite, oil, copper, nitrates, and the list goes on and on. But like, this is it. This is the very core of this perverse ideology that leads people to view the world in terms of what they can extract. By no means am I saying trade or industry are inherently bad. I love the toys that allow me to, to talk to a camera and yap about this stuff. But I think when a region is merely regarded as a source of raw extractable materials that someone can come in and claim, the inevitable consequence is the dehumanization of its inhabitants, reducing their existence to a mere obstacle in the pursuit of profit. That of course was the case with bananas, that of course was the case with oil, with the sulfuric acid, with coffee, the list goes on and on. And you know, I'd love to say that you know we've learned from these mistakes, but I think this document right here says otherwise. Take a look at this document. This is an agreement between developers of a hydroelectric plant and some 50 indigenous community members and leaders of Roca Pontilla. But what's really interesting about this, and, and no, no pun intended, but you know, if it doesn't stick out like a sore thumb, most people would take a look at this, these last pages with all these alleged signatures, and determine that if you have to sign with your thumbprint, you probably aren't capable of reading. The people who are agreeing to these contracts signing with their thumbprints have no idea what they are signing. They get some vague promises from outsiders coming in saying that they'll build schools and pave the roadways and don't worry about what the rest of the contract says, just give me your thumbprint so we can get the land grant and do what we need to do. And then a few years later, when they inevitably build something that is rather destructive and pollutes the rivers or the groundwater or whatever it might be, they have the legal documents to back them up. The environmental and human toll of these projects has been well documented and disastrous, as covered by this Vice documentary from 2021. Beyond the contracts that exist today that still exploit the indigenous communities and destroy the environment around them, the United States has had and continues to have a remarkable role in the reconstruction of Guatemala. According to Aviva Chomsky's book, Central America's Forgotten History, USAID assisted in the disbandment of the cooperatives in rural areas of Guatemala. Oil was discovered in the western jungles near the Mexican border, so USAID collaborated with the Guatemalan government on highway construction to open up land to domestic and foreign oil companies in addition to mining, ranching, cattle, and logging interests. You know, USAID is infamous for sterilizing 300,000 or more indigenous Peruvian women, trying to subvert and overthrow the wildly popular Fidel Castro, and working with the AFL-CIO to overthrow the democratically elected leader of Chile, Salvador Allende, who 
mind you, was not a communist either. But its role around the world in subtly or not so subtly advancing America's interest in the wake of the destruction caused by the American military or the CIA has really only reinforced America as the number one meddler in other countries' affairs. So I think we need to talk with someone whose affairs have been meddled. This gentleman works for an NGO in Guatemala that's directly funded by USAID. And he's chosen to speak openly about his experience working with them on the condition of anonymity for fear of losing his job. Although he spoke for over three hours, a few points stuck out to me in particular. Number one, USAID funds are dished out to American NGOs. For example, have you heard of World Vision or Petra Day, RTI International? Those are the large NGOs that they have been on the projects, they assemble the teams in Guatemala, and they execute. That's the only way in which the projects are, are well, If you weren't RTI, if you weren't War Vision, you're not getting any money. Do development projects in Guatemala as a Guatemalan. That's difficult. It's difficult. You have to be an American citizen, an American business, or an American organization in order to secure any kind of funding. USAID sets the goals and the vision of the country's development, not the Guatemalan people on the ground. Plus, you have to be an American citizen to get the funds in the first place. Number two, USAID funds can only be used to purchase American goods. So no Huawei, no TikTok on phones, no Chinese hardware. And this seriously limits what they can buy. But even more importantly, it locks them into an oftentimes predatory maintenance ecosystem in which if something breaks, they need to turn to Uncle Sam once again to get it fixed. There have been some restrictions, and I'd say that in the US, USAID, specifically, they have this restriction on Chinese equipment, notifications, equipment, primarily, but some others, uh, Chinese software, there is also this, people with Kaspersky antivirus that is also banned, TikTok is banned, lots of different things. But when they want to execute their projects, they ask you to buy American. They want to see like this, not, not necessarily export potential, but they say it in another way. They want to see like, yeah, it's uh, you know, it's because of the credibility, the processes, the practices of American companies. So they they need to buy American companies. That way, if you get to see here, American drugs that were donated, and it's probably USAID donated four drugs, Chevy Vans. Well, that's not another point here, but, <laughs> but you know, American brands. Uh, and they're really powerful because it's kind of uh, like a, it, it creates kind of like a dependence, um, dependence uh, relationship because when they come here, they implement American technology. I mean, who's gonna give it maintenance? Guatemalan people, but when something goes wrong, who's gonna go? The American company. USA, baby. USA, yes. Yeah. Lastly and most damning, USAID coordinated with the CIA to train and arm death squads in the Guatemalan military and police forces. As seen in this cable from 1966, CIA officer Byron Engel and former U.S. Border Patrol agent John Longin collaborated on efforts to train security forces in Guatemala under the cover of USAID. According to Yale professor Greg Gandon, Longin taught local intelligence and police agencies how to create death squads to target political activists, deploying tactics that he'd used earlier to capture migrants on the border. He arrived in Guatemala in late 1965 and put into place a paramilitary unit that early the next year would execute what he called Operacion Limpieza, or Operation Clina. Within three months, this unit conducted over 80 raids and multiple assassinations, including an action that, over the course of four days, led to the capture, torture, and execution of more than 30 prominent left-wing opposition leaders. The military dumped their bodies into the sea, while the government denied any knowledge of their whereabouts. So in summary, John Longin, a Border Patrol agent, began working with the CIA and helped put into place death squad regimes in Guatemala that accelerated a civil war, which in turn produced biblical levels of displacement. And now, neoliberal American politicians have the audacity to stand in front of the very people who they have raped, pillaged, and genocided and say, do, do not, not come. come. Do not come. I'm gonna come. Like there have been many months uh, in Guatemala over the past two years when the massacres have been at their worst. Like 
two, three, four month periods where nothing would come out in the major U.S. media, and in that period, maybe 4,000 people had been killed in a series of very bloody, spectacular massacres. And that's just the way you know the, the system happens to function. Okay, uh, we've we've gone through a lot in this video, and it could have been 10 times as long, but we need a quick review of what we've discussed so far. In 1954, the United States overthrew the democratically elected leader, Jacobo Arbenz because he wanted the government to purchase uncultivated land, including his own, to redistribute to the people of Guatemala. He was not a communist and he had zero ties to the Soviet Union. The CIA used bombs and psychological warfare to oust him. From 1954 to the 1970s, brutal military dictators kept trying to purge the country of communism by slaughtering the indigenous people of Guatemala. The death squads were trained by CIA operatives under the cover of USAID. The Guatemalan military was funded and armed by the United States government. In 1978, Lucas Garcia gets into power and starts mass killing indigenous people. Jimmy Carter pretended to embargo Guatemala because of human rights, but still sent $8.5 million in military assistance and $1.8 million in export licenses for the sale of arms between 1978 and 1980. From 1978 onwards, Israel stepped up and sold arms to fill the void of the United States direct arms sale embargo. And in 1982, Efrain Riosmont took over in a coup. He promised less bloodshed, but actually led the bloodiest military dictatorship in Guatemalan history. Ronald Reagan described him as a good man. And in 1994, the UN Truth Commission determined 200,000 were killed, mostly Mayan, mostly under Riosmont. They recommended the restoration of material possessions and compensation. It was a genocide funded by the United States, armed by Israel and the United States, and orchestrated by capitalists, the wealthy, and the landowners. In 2013, Efrain Riosmont was convicted of genocide. He was sentenced to 80 years in prison, but never ended up serving time. He died in 2018 at age 91. And here in our present day, Kamala Harris tells Guatemalans fleeing violence not to come. Arevalo's son, Bernardo, is the current president of Guatemala. Capitalists are still actively exploiting the indigenous and destroying their land. And USAID weasels its way into everything, all for the sake of subsidizing US businesses, once again under the auspices that they're doing something valiant, like rebuilding the country. So what do we do with this information, right? Like this is a lot, this is a lot to take in, you know? And it's evident that this wasn't just anti-communist hysteria, right? Like Arbenz was not a communist. He was, he had no relation whatsoever to the Soviet Union. But like I said earlier, I think when, when people are viewed as obstacles in the pursuit of capital or wealth accumulation, they are cast aside and oftentimes killed. And don't take it from me, take it from the CIA operative who coordinated all of the death squads. It seems evident that the Guatemalan security forces will continue to be used, as in the past, not so much as the protectors of the nation against communist enslavement, but as the oligarchy's oppressors of legitimate social change. And hey, I mean, you know, do you think the, the father of public relations really meant to start a genocide and immigration crisis as a consequence of promoting a fruit? Probably not, realistically. But that's blowback for you. Hey, uh, thanks for watching this video. Um, please consider liking and subscribing. Also consider checking out some of my other videos. Uh, I'll be uploading a lot more frequently now that I'm back in the United States. And uh, drop a comment. Let me know what you thought about this. It obviously took a lot of a lot of time and effort. And also, you know, big shout out to Diego. Thank you for sharing your story, man. Like 74 years of fighting the good fight. So cheers to that.